Amen. Amen. Good morning, Salem. If I haven't met you yet, I'm Pastor Jason, and it's a joy to be with you today. We are in week two of this series called The Struggle is Real. And today, I want us to uh, think back a little bit to when we were young, but also to last, yes, last day, yesterday, yesterday morning, Saturday mornings. What does a typical Saturday morning in your life look like? Are you a sleep-in kind of person? Do you chase kid activities or grandkid activities around? Are you a yard work on Saturday morning kind of person? Maybe you're a get up and go. We got places to go and errands to run. Maybe you have to work on Saturday morning. Or maybe you're a sip some coffee and take it slow, right? Whatever your typical plan is on Saturdays, I think sometimes the, our attitude towards our whole weekend is shaped on what's going on Saturday morning. For instance, a couple weeks ago, my boys were in a one-day basketball tournament, and we got the schedule. Their first game was at 8 o'clock in the morning. We live in East Tomball, and their first game and the tournament was held in South Cyprus. The coach wanted them there at 7.30. We left before we normally leave for school, man. The struggle is real sometimes on Saturday mornings. At least it is in my world. What about when you were, let's say if you're 30 years old and older, right? Think back 25, 30, 40, 50 plus years. How many of you on a Saturday morning used to watch cartoons? Raise your hand if Saturday morning cartoons was a thing. All right. Remember these guys, Wiley e. Coyote and the Roadrunner? Think about their attitude for a second. Wiley e. Coyote was determined, resolute, passionate towards trying to catch the Roadrunner, who's so fast he's off the screen today. <laughs> what about the Roadrunner's attitude? He was kind of cautious, careful, yet somewhat optimistic, positive about the whole thing. And that was characterized by his famous Mimi. Let's take a quick look at this video to give some context to people that are under the age of 30. Here we go. If you're under the age of 30, you have no appreciation for the fact that you, we would have to wait a whole week to see our favorite cartoon. We couldn't just grab a remote and watch it. So that was a fun cartoon for me when I was a kid. And one of my favorite parts is the Roadrunner never really fought back, right? Somehow, Wiley e. Coyote always found a way to keep his narrow focus, this blind oblivion almost. He could have found something else to eat, but he was so determined to get the Roadrunner. Well, my guess is you came to worship today not just to hear some Looney Tunes logic. So let's get into the Word of God. We're going to 1 Samuel chapter 24-ish is where we're going to land. And here's what I've learned about Saul and David. If I can remind you what happened last week, David was entered into the service of Saul and doing lots of battles and things, and Saul didn't like David after a while, kind of became jealous of him and tried to kill him twice. But David evaded and, and got away from him, and I wrapped it all up last week. Huh? 
I, I wrapped it up last week by telling you that David got out the window and got a, escaped from Saul. Well, that whole pursue, flee, chase, escape, similar to like Wile E. Coyote and the Roadrunner is happening between Saul and David. Then David fled, 1 Samuel 20. That day David fled from Saul, 1 Samuel 21. David left Gath and escaped, 1 Samuel 22. David stayed in the wilderness strongholds and in the hills of the desert of Ziph. Day after day, Saul searched for him, but God did not give David into his hands, 1 Samuel 23. You begin to notice that God is divinely protecting David from this man. So we go to chapter 24. So Saul took 3,000, wow, able young men from Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. Everyone remembers where that is. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there, and Saul went in to <clears throat> relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. Can you imagine the whisper conversation that ensued between David and his men? David, he's here. He's relieving himself. Kill him. This is it. God has delivered him into your hands. Go. And David sneaks up next to where Saul is, and he cuts off a corner of his robe. And he's so kind of uh, conscience-stricken, the Word of God says, for having cut off a corner of his robe, he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him. For he is the anointed of the Lord. With these whispering words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went his way. After which David came out of the cave and called out to Saul, my Lord, the king, why do you think I'm trying to harm you? My men wanted me to attack you, to kill you, and I could have done it in the cave. But I didn't cut off a corner of your robe. Why do you think that I'm trying to harm you? I'm not. What do you have against me? Did God send you to pursue me or did someone else? My son David, is that you? <laughs> you treated me well, and I treated you badly. You could have killed me. What enemy does that to his foe? I've sinned, David. You're going to be king and do great things. Please don't hurt my family. I won't. I promise. All right. So there was this interchange that almost makes it sound like Saul was repentant, remorseful, right? Two chapters later. So Saul went down to the desert of Ziph with his 3,000 select Israelite troops. I'm guessing he's not inviting him to Thanksgiving to search there for David. And Saul and his 3,000 men camp for the night, and they're staying in a big field area. And Saul has his commander of the army, Abner, right next to him. And next to Saul's head is his spear and a jug of water. And David convinces one of his men to go spy out where they are. The Word of God says the Lord had put them in a deep sleep. And David and Abishai is the guy that goes with him. See that right next to Saul, there's a sword and there's a jug of water. And Abishai says, let me have one shot. I will pin him to the ground with his own spear. I won't miss. I only need one shot. Except he was whispering. <laughs> and David says, don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? 
as surely as the Lord lives. The Lord himself will strike him, or his time will come and he will die, or he will go into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Now get the spear and the water jug that are near his head. Let's go. The next verse says, David took the spear and the water jug. Maybe Abishai didn't want to. Maybe Abishai really wanted to kill him and David wouldn't let him. Maybe Abishai was so shamed that he would think that way about the Lord's anointed king. And then David and Abishai go up on a hill and they call out to this army in the middle of the night, Abner, wake up, Abner. You did something wrong. You didn't guard the king. Where's the king's spear and his water jug? Is that you, David, my son? Yes, it is, my lord. Why are you chasing me? How do you think that I have wronged you? Did God send you to pursue me, or did someone else? I have sinned, David. You could have killed me today, but you didn't. I will try not to harm you again. Send someone to come get your spear, king. I could have killed you today, but I didn't. I valued your life. May the Lord continue to value my life. You will be blessed, David. You will do great things. I feel like Saul, in that moment, was resolute, determined, focused, narrow-minded, blind, oblivion to everything else on trying to kill David. Eh? What about us? What are the things that turn our eyes away from the Lord and cause us to have significant blinders on? We get so determined. What, here's another way to ask it, what is shaping your attitude in life right now? What is the thing you are pursuing so much, maybe even on Saturday mornings. Unfortunately, I think there are times where life's circumstances can cause our attitude to flip in a quick hurry. Happened in my life. My brothers and I took my dad out for his birthday last month. And we decided to have an all sports day. We all love sports, so we played a little bocce ball in the park, played a couple of games of doubles tennis, and then went and played a couple games of bowling. Then we grabbed some food and went to my parents' house and watched March Madness. It was a beautiful day. I don't remember the last time my brothers and I and my dad went bowling. The first game went pretty well. My dad got 119, my brother Matt 108. I had 132, but I did have a split in the 10th frame, so that was kind of hard. Jonathan, the young one, got 150. That was annoying. (laughs) But we all had some strikes and spares, and we had enough time that we said, let's play another game. Everybody improved, except one person. The wheels fell off my attitude bus around uh, frame five. The three gutter, that was a good frame for me. After the bowling, my brother John, the one that won both games, takes his phone out and takes that picture. And I flipped. I'm like, you will not post that on social media. Because I think for me it was a bigger deal to not be real, to kind of keep this fake persona out there that everything in my life is great. That is the lowest bowling game I've ever had in my adult life, by the way, 66. It's a number of the devil. (laughs) (laughs) And after being convicted about how the struggle is real, even in my own prideful attitude, I asked John to text me that picture. I said, maybe I'll use it in a sermon someday. 
The struggle is real, and I am so thankful that we have a God that does not condemn us for our wily coyote, blind pursuits, our determined, resolute focus on something other than him. I'm so thankful we have a God who doesn't condemn us when our attitude is like a roller coaster shaped by the things that happen in this world. Instead, we have a God who so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, Jesus, the one who lived a perfect life for you and me, the one who died in our place to take away all of our sins and the punishment of it, the one who rose again to conquer sin and death now and for all eternity, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That's the God we serve. That's the God that wants our absolute number one attention, and David knew it. Psalm 16, our Leah already shared some of these verses. David writes, I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, my tongue rejoices, my body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. David, the one that was known as a man after God's own heart, certainly not a sinless man, but one who didn't sin against God when he could have killed Saul twice. He says, my eyes are on the Lord. I got to focus on him. And he wrote a bunch of them down in that book of Psalms for us. I'm not going to be shaken by the roller coaster of circumstances in this world. My heart, the inner parts of me is glad. I'm going to rest secure, maybe even on Saturday mornings. That would be a good thing in my world path of life, eternal pleasures fill me with joy. Salem, let's strive for the attitude of David here. Maybe next Saturday morning, you could do a little attitude check. No matter what you have going on, you could pray something like, Lord, before the roadrunner type activities are filling my day, my weekend, help me to run this race for your glory. Help me to see the people around that I can bless and care for. As you do your attitude check, maybe you can also think to yourself, my tongue rejoices. Lord, help my tongue to rejoice today, this weekend, tomorrow, next Saturday, because my eyes are fixed on you. So Salem, anyone want to go bowling? I'm good for one game. That's all you get. Let's pray about all this. Lord God, we thank you and praise you that you sent Jesus to be Savior. It's too often we've got our blinders on. We're seeing things through our narrow lens, and we're determined and resolute and have a bit of an oblivion like Wiley Coyote. Forgive us, Lord, for the times where we've replaced you with anything and everything but. Lord, today we ask that you would give us that same resolute, determined heart to focus on you, to point other people to your grace that is not dependent on our kids' trophies or the shape of our yard or flower beds or even on our bowling score. We thank you, Lord, that your grace covers all. We praise you, Lord, for that today for the attitude of David, may we have that same type of attitude to not be shaken by the circumstances of this world. We love you, Lord. We trust you, and we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.